I feel good, uh, even though I shouldn't. I'm chilling so hard, couldn't tell you where the hood is. Uh, I'm looking like a million bucks, sucker. I'm Welcome to This Week in Music. My name is Ian Rogers, and we are here today in the Nashville home of Jamie Liddell. Hello. How's it thank going? You, thank you for joining us. My uh, pleasure. If you, don't, you. if you don't mind, I'm actually going to I'm gonna start by telling you how it is I stumbled across you okay. uh, once upon a time. I am, uh -huh. I'm a huge fan of Mojo Magazine, and uh -huh. they wrote a glowing review of Multiply once upon a time and it was a time when I had um, I was actually uh, dealing with subscription services and, and I so I'd never heard of it and typed, oh, it, right. typed it in hit play you know you, you nine times out of ten when you do that it's someone else's favorite record yeah, not yours yeah, yeah, yeah. but it was, it was it was one of those things where I went wait a minute how how have I never heard of this guy mm -hmm. what's where does it where did this come from and for me as you know a huge soul music fan in general yeah, right. I was I was just I was amazed at how well you pulled it off oh, well, right thanks, it sounded um, you should have so seen how it was made <laughs> actually you know it's kind of in a weird way it was kind of like a Motown production but I'm sorry that's getting off the point but no no awesome yeah I mean it, well, it was it's interesting now because I mean that was a turning point for me a huge turning point 2005 well let's start out do me a favor tell me what what Tell for people who don't know, mm -hmm. for someone who might might know not not know a Jamie Liddell record and hasn't right. had the experience that I had of being a fan or have had of being a fan yeah, for a long yeah, time. Yeah. What what it is you do? How would you describe it? Well, I mean, I've been releasing records since '95, but back in those days, there wasn't a lot of singing involved. It was mostly electronics, and uh, I would mumble over a beat, but you know. I didn't want to commit to being a singer at that time. I just didn't think I could hold it down. Um, but as time progressed, oh, but, but that said, I did do an album in about 98, um, which landed me a deal with Warp Records. I mean, around about that time I was doing, I was involved in a, um, in a duo, sort of soul, cyber soul duo called um, Super Collider which I'm still really proud of the stuff that we did, me and Christian Vogel. Yeah. We really like, were pushing the envelope of the technology we had at the time, trying to make music that we'd never heard before. You know, kind of like a crazy fusion of, of, like, of like, you know, recognizable kind of P-funk soul with some kind of unrecognizable techno sound. And, and it kind of, it got, us, it got us a fair bit of underground, you know, cred. And like from that and the combination of me having a studio with Christian in Brighton back in England back in the day, I was just like feverishly making a solo record, which I'd hoped to release on Spy Mania Records, which put out Square Pusher. So it was also a kind of friend of mine from the time, Tom Jenkinson, who's signed to Warp, you know. So through Spy Mania, Tom Jenkinson heard it and he played it to the guys at Warp and then I had an interview with them and then I signed a five album deal with them back in 1999. And then I made, that album came out as a license from Spy Mania around about that time. And then I, I had- I was gonna say, I actually didn't realize that album was on Warp. I thought it was Spy Yeah, Mania well it, yeah, it's a license, that's the thing. Gotcha. So, but my first fully fledged album was, was Multiply, which came out years later. Yeah, I was gonna, why the big gap in that? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I was just pretty, I was just really, I don't know, well, there was a Super Collider record in 2002 that right. did take up a huge amount of time. Those records were just epic, like, voyages of, you know, we'd spend a month on a track just actually finishing the production of it. This, I mean, it's totally unnecessary. We were just smoking way too much weed and just kind of just listening to a loop for you know, a few days right but it was amazing i mean i learned a ton i mean i forgot a ton at the same time but it's just like that well listening to those albums i can't really remember how we managed to do it but at the same time i left brighton and moved to berlin so the huge life overhaul and it's I was skin absolutely skin i didn't have you know two euros to rub together two marks at that time so I was just kind of like holding it down, you know. Yeah. So actually, I'd run out of money. I'd run out what of were you recording doing for budget. Money? So you so you started you started releasing records in 1995. Right. Multiply didn't come out till 2005. Right. So that's 10 years of of you know. Welcome to my world. What? Yeah, I mean, just where was like, the money coming from? Yeah, I mean, I got money from Loaded Records, which was the label that put out Super Collider, 
We, uh, but but we only did one record with them. So then we actually went independent on the second one, which was released on Christian's own label, Rise Robots Rise Records. R R R R. R. And then uh, the, that was the, the kings it. of the entire cyber soul genre. Well, there you go. That's what I mean, I mean, <laughs> there's a big crowd of genre. But it's a, yeah, I mean, you know, it's there's yeah, I mean, there's room to grow. I mean, it's funny actually because we toured with Janelle Monae a fair bit, and she kind of is yeah. in that very much in that zone. It's kind of. It's taken a while, but it's maybe a, it's maybe got some room to grow. I mean, it's um, but yeah, I mean, I did. I spent ages doing it, and I, I I needed someone to get me back on track, and it turned out to be this guy called Mocky, who I made a lot of music with. We we made Multiply from things that were hanging around on my hard drive. A combination of Mocky and Matthew Herbert basically got me on the right track. Matthew Herbert asked me to do a remix because he liked my stuff and. I was basically making my money from playing live, to answer your question. It was like that was the only way I could do it. So I had to basically reinvent myself as a, as a performer because I had no money. So it's like the records aren't gonna. I've spent the advance. And so and so when you're reinventing yourself as a performer, is this where you're both singing and looping? Exactly. And I didn't have. How did you come into that? Because right. and actually describe it for somebody who hasn't seen it. The first time I okay. saw you, by the way. Uh, I think, and I was, I'd been a fan for a while, but the first time I saw you was opening for Beck at the Wiltern or something. Is that what oh, yeah. sense? Oh, yeah, yeah. The puppet totally show tour. Man. Oh, yeah, for, that was a him. great tour. It's That's how you. I met Justin, actually. It's Justin oh. Stan. That's what we met. He's in the band. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. The, so you, this is you on stage by yourself. Exactly. Um, it with, with, certainly was then in those days. Yep, with, a, with an array of effects and yeah. a mic or two, even. Soul Scientist. Basically, and and uh, and and it's like that. Is that the show that you were that you were making money on effectively it before? It was exactly that. It was in a very primitive stage back in the day. I'd be playing for a few hundred euros in 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 Germany and in Europe, exclusively Europe. You know, just I just had a couple of guitar effects pedals. I didn't have a computer or any fancy stuff. But then I had this vision using those things about another tool. That I could I could imagine that would be another looper. So I actually spent six months like learning how to program it on a computer, and then I made my own custom looper, which is I still use today, which is like a one of a kind. Wait, so you wrote the software? I, I, well, I wrote it in Max MSP. I didn't write the actual software. I mean, it right, right. kind of is programming. It's modular programming. It's right, a right. pain in the ass. Um, but um, yeah, I just knew that there was a way to do it that would fit what I was trying to do with a looper. So once I had that, I just learned to, I put all my energy into it like I was playing guitar every day. Right. And it became my instrument and I could communicate with it. Well, that, and that was what I thought was so striking when I saw it on tour, that it was like an instrument. And I, yeah. I had only, I, what I thought was cool actually is that I, I appreciated what I heard on the record, but you don't know how you, somebody made a record, right? And then the right. fact that when you did it live, you treated it like an instrument there was yeah, yeah, yeah. there was a combo, and it makes sense now that you say it that mm -hmm. that's how you were earning a living. So you had to right. get damn good at it, like a guitar player would get good at shredding. Exactly, you it was just to, that. You had, yeah. to, you had to shred with the yeah. with the effects. So that was it. So I just I worked out where doing a one man show. There was always basically back in the day, it was amazing. I got like, I mean, I, I I it was really a rambling show. I just like had no plan at all, no set list, no songs, nothing. Just, I just get on stage, start making sound, and it would all just be Sun Ra style, just like right. whatever you can pick out from the crowd and with your, with your mind. Uh, basically, like 75% of it was kind of searching, but the 25% that were on were like this crazy magic. It was like, hi, I've never really got that back, to be honest. Huh. Just that total freedom to play in small venues, with people kind of pretty loose. They weren't like, there wasn't, your name wasn't on the banner. It was like, you know, yeah. it was just kind of like a, you know, I was almost like a DJ just playing experimental music. Right. And uh, kind of, I do miss that in a way. But I mean, through that and through me and Mocky, I'd, I'd start to want to make more songs just because I was like, man, I need to sing some songs. You know, yeah. it's great when I have a couple of set pieces in my show. So I was ending up doing a couple of cover versions, you know, and then I started writing a few things. And like Matthew Herbert asked me to do a remix of one of his songs, and I, I said I had a studio, but I was lying. I just had, you know, I didn't have anything really solid, but I got it together. He, he gave me a couple of days to do the mix. So I just sort of worked it out in Berlin, and I did it in a Motown style, just because I, I was running out of time, and I thought, well, what do I know, and what can I do quickly? And so I'm just going to take this song and just do it in a Motown style. 
Right. Because the main riff of the tunes reminded me of like a, like a real soul hook. So making that song was made me think, man, I love doing this. This is sweet. So I just ended up doing more of it. And then I was just kind of like, well, I love singing. I love this. I mean, I, I've got a good setup here with a few people I met in Berlin. And Maki came along and he was like loving my voice and just like, he's got that producer head. It's like, oh man, I can see this, you know? And we start dreaming like a sound up and that's basically what multiply multiply is made on a laptop in like you know in the back streets of berlin basically from found rooms and <laughs> just scrapping it together really and, but, and the reaction was great but that you weren't you weren't a household name right so no uh, but yeah how what, what was the were you surprised by the reaction to it i was really happy that the uk picked up on it I mean, it, it was kind of, it was also one of those things I learned about the music business. You can do great work, which a lot to do with timing. And obviously I got lucky because Berlin was like the hottest place in Europe right. to live, you know? So everyone wanted a combination story of like music, but also what's it like in Berlin? Every interview is like, so Berlin, right. it's like, wow. After a while, it's so driving nuts, you know, it's just Berlin, Berlin. It's like, well, well, you want to interview Berlin, do you know what I mean? Right. Just go and talk to the bear or whatever. But um, <laughs> that's it, I ended up just kind of being in the right place at the right time. Right. And also, soul music, that English soul thing, the English are always suckers for that. So yeah. they, they love a bit of Northern soul. They're just, you know, they're just, it's in, that's why I love it. It's kind of the it. story of, of British invasion. Yeah, is, yeah, is, absolutely. You know, America, America, to, to, Amer totally, yeah, America yeah. To, to UK and back. Big tape right? loop, exactly. Yeah. Like, oh, well, let's see, let's try and do that. And then you try and do like something and it always comes out sounding like something else. I mean, it's just before Amy Winehouse, just basically yep. a year later, just, you know, dominated with that soul sound, which yeah. is still around today, you know, and it's really kind of popular, but. So what happened next? I'm curious, um, you know, on the show, we talk a lot about music business. So I'm curious for, you know, how you, right. you know, you go from, you go from being, you know, uh, broken, you know, and without a, a new record to having sort of a new, mm -hmm. a new vision and a new style or a new label and, yeah, right. and some recognition and, you know, doing touring worldwide and, yeah. um, and then you move from Berlin to, to New York and, you know, get, get us, get us through the, the next stage of the story. Yeah. I mean, Berlin was the home of, uh, Multiply 2005 and also Jim, which came out in, uh, 2008. Um, again, fairly long break. But I mean, I was the Multiply was a big album for me, and it had a it had a long tour cycle. Right. And uh, so sort of I got a band together and really transformed that whole solo thing into a band thing, which was another huge transformation for me. I wasn't really meant to be a band leader. I mean, I still say that to this day. I'm not naturally of that mindset. But anyway, I was transforming those songs into another kind of style for live we went out and toured and then i ended up playing here in the, in the states a fair bit and just and yeah and then i ended up doing a tour with beck about 2006 i think and um just slowly like the whole thing was expanding and meanwhile i was writing other songs but i've been terrible at multitasking when i'm on the road i don't write right. i know a lot of people are like always kind of you know they've got a pen going and like, songs on the brew I mean, I can relate to that more now. I'm more prolific now than I ever was. But um, why is that? You've just gotten better at it, you think, or yeah, possibly. Yeah, it's more natural. Yeah, I wasn't really a songwriter. I mean, that's the thing. I was an electronic musician, you know, and I'm more kind of, of an improviser, you know. Right. Yeah, exactly. Now I just kind of feel like I. Well, I feel like I kind of I can translate basically a little sketch into something finished, whereas before I could. That's why I needed Bucky. Because I could sketch for days, like cool ideas, but nothing really yeah. had a start and a middle. Nothing really. How much concrete. of that is is the feedback that you get from releasing things and getting you know feedback from people on what they think about it? Um, ho hopefully not that much, but you know what I mean. I ended up getting a little bit. I mean, multiply went down so well uh, that it, I definitely wanted to follow it up, and in a way, that's why I made Jim. But I, that's not saying I, I regret making Jim, but it was just definitely an effort to capitalize on that. And yeah. sort of, in a way, business move, it was. I mean, I, I, I don't a, really... I gotta make another one of those because kind of, I yeah. wanna keep doing this. And plus I loved it, but at the same time, yeah. there was a little lack of innovation. I've always been really keen on just kind of keeping it 
you know, changing it up all the time. I don't really ever want to like feel comfortable. Right. I don't want to feel uncomfortable. I just want to feel like I'm really Pushing behind it. it, you know, like really inspired. So after gym, you came to New York. I did. Yeah, that's right. I mean, to the next record got together with Beck. Mm -hmm. So what's tell us that story real quick. Well, he called um, and just well, we'd done that touring. And uh, he loved the Looper thing. He just loves me doing that. Right. And um, did a little show with him and Nigel Godridge uh, called In the Basement. Yeah. And like, we flew over after the Beck. I was playing Bumbershoot or something. And I flew in from from that gig to do it with, with Beck. And like, so Nigel really liked it too, you know. So right. we kind of had this thing. And Nigel, who's Radiohead's producer. Yeah. So yeah, no, yeah. Um, and... And so th there was that kind of like good feeling kind of left hanging and he just he got into the production game with Charlotte Gainsbourg and yep. he gave me a call like, do you want to do something then? I said, well, yeah. I was actually right, I just moved to New York. Was that, one, was that the second thing he'd done after Charlotte? Was your, was yeah. your record? Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. So that's it. That. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty sweet. I mean, it was, it, was, it was really cool that he just wanted to do it because I was kind of lacking a little bit of vision, motivation and... Kind of just he just really kind of made me think. Oh, okay, it can be done. Let's do it. It's on. You know what I mean. So it, sometimes all you need is this. It's on. You know, it was Mocky, someone that just makes yeah. you feel like it's it, it's time to kind yeah. of get busy. So like that was great. And I I cracked that album out in a year, start to finish, from writing to recording to mastering, which was pre six months even. And the recording six process months. was quite a bit different though. You were saying you did yeah, you know yeah. real studio, real studio, studio exactly. musicians. Yeah, I mean, there was a certain amount of that with Jim. We recorded in Fair Bear in Paris, which is where you know, Serge Gainsbourg did some stuff. And right. it's a pretty sweet studio too. But, I mean, we only did a couple of days there. I can never, I've never been able to afford, like, hair metal, but there's never been a hair metal budget for me. Right. Those warp budgets are not... They're, they're, they're you know, I love Guns warp. Guns and Roses. No, they're definitely, uh, yeah, it's more of a Sheffield. I mean, Sheffield did have Def Leppard. I'm sure they probably... Um, probably cracked out some money back in their time. It's more, it's more, yeah, they're, they're, they're conscious. That's why Warp is still around today. Exactly. Let's put it that way. Right. Um, and, and I love them for it. And, but, um, but yeah, we did a couple of days at Ocean Way on campus with Beck and we had James Gadsden and amazing players. And yeah. It was a totally other experience. And you know, and then from New York, moved to Nashville. So, Which is a uh, the third the third coast. The, the, yeah, exactly. So we it's just so this why, why why Nashville? I don't know what that is. It's like East Coast West Coast, some kind of book turning page. Um, Nashville. Well, we'd heard good things about it, especially from Pat Sansone, Wilco, and uh, a gentleman named Mr. Jimmy, who you can hear in the background now and again. Uh, he's sitting in the, in the room over there. He says, we ended up meeting and, and, and working live, you know, on the last record. And like, he was, he actually, he, he was always like, I'm not gonna say anything about Nashville. I'm not gonna like hype it up for you. Just saying like, you know, it's there, and check it out. Right. Which for me, obviously was like, he's hyping it up. And, yeah. You know I mean? It's it one of those, it's kind of the one that's gentle hypes. So I was just saying, you know. But anyway, we came here, we basically hated it. We, we arrived, like it was a dreary winter's day. Right. It just looked like middle America to us. And we're like, oh, Really? We move here? Because we're living in New York, man. It's the center of the bloody universe. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like, and, uh, but driving around, and you just it didn't get the right, didn't get Nashville. Just didn't, just passed it off like, nah. But, but then we stuck around a little bit and we met a really cool real estate agent, just sort of, and a few other people just here in town that just kind of opened up the place and made us realize that it's about small communities and really good people. And like, there's, there's not a lot of you know restaurants, not a lot of you know, cities can give you you know huge amounts of everything. This town has you know pockets, and you just like slowly learn where they are and get your hands in them. And then, uh, but we met great people, really amazing people that just made us think, oh, this is really cool. And then we found this house, and we started looking at really beautiful properties through this real estate agent, who's an amazing person, and we're still really good friends with her today. And then we just sort of really fell in love with it, actually, really quickly, and we just thought. Within like a few days, we decided to just move and buy a house, and we ended up buying this place pretty much just like as almost a spontaneous decision. 
and it was just an, it was it felt really natural and so this place moving, is blessed and you're moving out of a box in new york city into a yeah, yeah. palatial estate in well, nashville absolutely we had 800 square feet in new york and this is three and a half thousand you know right so it's just obscene and i've yeah it's, it's a, it, a quality it's, life here man it's it's yeah. great yeah i mean it's, it's, it, we're, we've, we've got more friends here. We've had so many people over and you would have thought New York is so easy for everyone to connect, but everyone's so busy. And there's always that thing in New York. I mean, I love New York, don't get me wrong. But um, there's always that thing like, I could be somewhere else right now. Right. You know, we could just be hopping in a cab and like, you know what I mean? There's always something in the back of your mind, like not content or something. So fast moving. And, but I, I mean, that's the thing, going back, I think th th what it's interesting we, we kind of ended up kind of meeting some people here some other creative people just t telling us like it's great to have in Nashville to, as a thinking space it's brilliant to write in a place that's kind of calm right and it, I totally agree with that we really look forward to coming back and just having this calm and time to like cre create something at your own pace and not have horrible rent to worry about and horrible you know yeah. the demands are less so your mind is a little bit more free so which, is, which is what you're doing here so you're making you were kind enough to give us this, this studio oh, yeah, tour yeah, and yeah, you're, yeah. you're making a record which will, which will come out on, also come out on more it will yeah yeah but it's what, what in house what about um, you know you, you've been doing some other interesting uh, interesting things with you know trying to connect directly with, with right. fans how, how are you how are you looking at that well, yeah, I mean, I've always, I've been really, um, I've been really lucky that people have stuck with me through my career. And I mean, you know, I do change direction a lot, so I should, by rights, have just lost everyone at every turn. But I think as I've got older, so have they, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's many theories. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've just got a lot of really cool fans. Um, and so it made total sense to sort of get a little bit more directly connected to them so i mean that's how we end up and what are you what are you offering them what's like what's, what's you when you look when you think like oh i'm gonna i've got these i've got right. these fans how do i give them something yeah yeah you know I'm, I'm you're not you're obviously not trying to trying to just get a dollar from them right you're trying, right. To, trying to give them something yeah special. yeah I mean, but this is, it's the, often the most basic things that i want to get right it's just like the thing that really drives me crazy is we'll say, oh, great show in Portland last night, and some fan will say, well, what do you mean you played in Portland last night? Right. A lot of people didn't know. So it's like, you kind of always assume the promoters are like really pushing your show. You right, know? and they've touched everybody who might be interested. And maybe through no fault of their own, they can only get such a reach. Sure, yeah. So to be able to just have that simple, powerful connection to say, look, we're in your town, you know? Just start from that, just that realization that you can, and you know, that people really on your mailing list want to be on your mailing list. I mean, that basic thing as well, just like they're not, you don't have to feel guilty like to reach out to them, like, I'm sorry to bother you, you know, if they want to get off the mailing list, they can. So you've got this attentive audience who wants to hear about stuff. I mean, I know how that is, being a fan of other things. I mean, I love to hear the news. So, I mean, I think sometimes for me in my English mentality, perhaps I think, oh, I don't want to bother people, you know. Right. Sorry for this mailer and everything, but right. I'm doing something new. It's like some really insane thing that I have. This maybe I, something I need to shift. It's that mentality of like people want to know. So getting a direct contact to them is amazing, you know. But as for what they can get, I mean that's always something that we have to think about. You know, obviously there's just the simple things. Some of my records are hard to find. Some right. of them are hard to find on vinyl. So that one of the big things we want to do is have all the physical stuff available for anyone at any time so they can just come to my homepage and everything related to me that you could possibly buy would be there. Yeah. Not to make a huge profit, but just like it's there and it's really nice that you can... It's the boutique mentality. Yeah, you don't have to go hunting for it. Here it is. Right. I'm going to give it to you. Yeah, I mean, that's where you should get it. If you're going to come to my home, home, then, you know, you get the home-baked cookies. Exactly. I mean, it's the equivalent of a home-baked cookie... Sonic, Sonic, Sonic biscuit equivalent. Well, yeah, I mean that's a tasty treat, you know. Website, we we can sell idea. these, you know. I mean that's but that's the thing. I mean, it's it. I, last time I, I, the first little outing that we had to make physical kind of sales thing possible on the site, I signed everything. I was upstairs like signing, 
every every album, every everything that we were sending out, except the t-shirts. I, mean, I hate signing t-shirts; and putting them, almost impossible. But I mean, um, so yeah, there, there was a huge attempt to just think. Well, look, if we've got the physical merch. I'm not got to do something to it. We can't just put it out. Yeah. Well, let me just sign it all. You know what I mean? Because there's not that many units, but it sure. still makes it special. So I just I'm of that mentality. It's just like anything I can do to sort of make it unique and and make it personal. I, I like that. You know, I'm, I'm I'm on an indie label for a reason. You know what I mean? I like that personal touch. I like the the craft of it all, and I like I like boutiques more than I like chain stores. You know what right. I mean? So. Um, and it's and what, like that. And so as you're finishing the new record, are you are you thinking about I mean, obviously you're thinking about the songs and you're thinking about the album. Mm -hmm. um, are you thinking about how you're going to present the album? You know, a super fan is going to get this version of the album and a less yeah, super fan right. is going to get a free track and there's a lot of things in between. Are you, is, that, is that already part of your, of your thought process or are you it's waiting not. on that? It's not. It, it possibly should be, yeah. I mean, it's definitely a lot of material that's not going to make it on the album that I know is going to be like B-roll. Right. You know, so-called B-roll. So, um... That, I want to keep that coming, you know. There's yeah. part of my mind which is like always thinking like, why album? Why not? Well, that was my, my next question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm I, having this kind of means of production thing going on here, and the way that music comes out and kind of waves, it makes yeah, me think it'd be so cool. To and see. when's this record coming out? Yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, nothing. here you are finishing music right. now. Why isn't it available next week? It's the age-old thing, isn't it? I mean, the thing is, you know. Yeah, I mean, you, people got to know that you're doing something. So the press machine is definitely a real one. And uh, I've had varying levels of success with that. Multiply was a good example. Yeah. It totally changed my career having a press agent in England that really cared. Because it made the entire record, I swear. It's the only reason why we're sitting here. It's because there was so much UK press that I actually got heard and then got reviewed, you know? It just was so much more of a push than I've ever had before. Right. And it started in England and it did radiate out, like they often say, and it's the old cliche, you're starting you know, in London or in the States in the right places, you can really do you a big favor. Yeah. And I saw that happening. And, but, and, and I understand that if I, if I just release a record now to the loyal fans, amazing. But then I possibly wouldn't grow that. And like, I, I do see the, the purpose of of a really effective press agent and that whole campaign thing. When it's on, it's amazing and it feels like something's really happening. Yeah, well, but, you know, the you music know. has to be amazing to, for that to work, right? Definitely. Um, and There's a lot of factors. But I think, I think that's right. I, you know, there was one artist that I worked with a, a number of years ago who said to me, hey, we, we love this direct-to-fan thing and we actually do really well at it. It's clear that it can be a... It can be a um, a real, we can, we can earn a living off of just the direct to consumer yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. But there's a, we, we, I don't, I don't think it's ego, but we want to grow. You know, we want to, we want the casual listener too, because that's, you know, yeah. you, you don't want to be just a click for kind of nerds. Right. Right. You want well, it to go further. Yeah, so I, yeah. I, I think that's right. I think it's, it's really um, fulfilling, you know, fulfilling all of that. And I, I mean, I think totally. that's the great thing about it is that you've got, you can you can do all of them at the same time, right? You yeah, can make, absolutely. Uh, a great record that goes kind of into that iTunes channel and into the press mm -hmm. channel, fantastic. But you're going to super serve your fans over here, and they're it's not one or the other. Right, right, um, right. I mean, I mean, certainly whilst I'm under contract with Warp, I mean, it will be interesting, like, to think about those questions when I'm out of that deal, which will be relatively soon. You know, yeah. so we'll probably reevaluate that and just see. We maybe just ask the fans how we'll get the response back. I mean, that is another amazing thing about having that contact. You can just ask people, yeah, about how they feel about stuff and just kind of just generally gauge. I mean, it is a little bit hard maybe to gauge certain things like that. Maybe that's sure. a little bit idealistic, but um. Certainly, just kind of listening and paying attention, and and like, you know, but I, I think to be a good artist, you can't. You, you just got to keep moving, you know. And some of the people that are your fans might jump ship because they might not like the new direction, and you know what I mean. That's yeah. all good. That's well, all good. All right. So as, um, before we wrap, a couple a couple more mm. questions. You know, you've you've you're clearly um, an independent-minded. 
artist, mm -hmm. uh, but you and, and you've been on you've got a partnership with an independent label you're fond of for a long time. So yeah. it'd be great. You know, we hear from uh, folks. You know, we on, on our show we've talked to independent independent artists and we've talked mm -hmm. to major record labels and you're and we've also talked to great independent record labels like Secretly Canadian and Jag Jaguar but mm -hmm. I don't think we've spoken to an artist who has okay. a good partnership with an independent label can you just tell us about the value of being a part of an independent label who's supportive and what's that like from your point of view well firstly and I think massively importantly is just that they they trust me you know they trust me to make music that they're gonna want and I, I feel like I've always got that kind of authority to just go off and create and they're going to be encouraging of, of what I make. So the creative freedom is like number one. And like, it's exciting to hand them stuff and the reaction is always so positive. They're like, oh man, brilliant, you know? Right. I mean, it's just like knowing, having had those relationships for so long is also something really sweet about not having changing board members and execs. And yeah. I know everyone quite personally, you know, within reason. Yeah. But in, in, in a, and that's very healthy for me. I like to have that when I email someone, I understand that's a, that's who they are. That's an important are. point. I mean, you've been, with, you've been with the label for how long? Mm -hmm. Since 99? Since yeah. And, 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 you've, and they've had a consistent workforce. That's something yeah. that, you yeah. know, you can't say about, about, about Right. About major labels at this right, point. Right. I mean, there's been a, you know, I, I work with majors a lot. There's mm -hmm. a bit of a revolving door at this point in a lot yeah, of places. Yeah. So, I mean, there's that. I mean, that's a huge thing, too. Um, and what about on the marketing and promotion side? Like, when the record comes mm -hmm. out, you know, obviously the budgets aren't huge, but how, what's the support? Do you feel like, you know, and, and their company's clearly not huge, but do you feel like they're able to, to get the music out there in the way that, that it serves you? In America, it's harder. It definitely is. Um, it's not really a fault of theirs. There's, they don't have a huge amount of manpower here in America. I mean, they're in an English label. They're based in London, and they have an office in New York. But it's kind of it's pretty small, really. I mean, they've really. I mean, that frustrates me a little bit now, just living in America and just right. wanting to, if ever, if ever there were a place I wanted to grow, it would be here because I right. like the idea of touring here, so I live here. Um, but I mean, that's the thing, I'm, they're very open at the same time to like ways to change that and like, that's also another thing I like, I can input. I can have a chat with the boss of the label and say, look, I really want to try and do something different this time and I want to do it like this and, and they're very open to that. You know, um, so, I mean, and we've changed the way that things have been marketed and pushed from record to record and tried different people and found people we like and found people we don't like so much. So, like, and, and I'm, I'm quite a big believer in sort of changing things up a fair bit. And, um, and, uh, and, and they've, well, they've always been really supportive of that. So, um, I mean, there's definitely room to grow. Right. There's definitely a lot of room to grow. And sometimes I am, I can't deny that I feel like I've made perhaps records that are bigger than Warp can handle. Right. I think they wouldn't really deny that either. Um, the sync agencies have been really great to keep me afloat. Right. <laughs> it's like, um, it's, 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 they, they really have. And that, that's been a huge asset to me. And the publishing side of everything has been something that Warp have helped me with a lot and, and it's worked out great for me. So for all the size, the size matters thing, Yeah. I mean, it does. When you deliver a real commercial record, the lack of radio play and like the lack of money behind it, I've definitely felt that. And right. like it is frustrating. And, and sometimes you think, man, this record probably could have gone a lot further. Right. And you can kind of sort of think about that in a, in a certain way or, or not. But then you just have to think about how to change that. And the most important thing that we've come up with is, is direct to fan. Because it's like, it's the only way that I can really think to grow this thing into the future properly. Right. And not just in a kind of way that could be fickle depending on how the press want to spin it. If the press hate my album, yeah. I'm not going to get the, the time. Whereas it could be genius and the press is full of shit. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so it's like, I don't want to be, I don't want to have to have some, you know, reviewer 
kind of like not get it and then suddenly like right. hurt my you've, if you've got prospect. this direct relationship yeah. that you've built with your fans they're gonna they're gonna be loyal that's um, the thing it's a huge thing. so what and you know to, to wrap things up what um you know I, what I think is is great part of the story that people should appreciate is it's been a long a long journey mm -hmm. uh, to here yeah. almost 20 years and yeah. You know, and, and ten years of that was really early, early growth. And I think yeah. people are a lot of times people expect things to happen right away, and nothing happens right away. Right. It all takes a long time and a long build. What what would you, what's your advice if you meet an artist who is effectively where you were, where you were in the mid '90s? Mm -hmm. What's your advice to them? Well, the, definitely the climate has changed a lot since I was doing it back in those days. But one thing that hasn't changed is you've got to be a great live performer. That's how I feel. I mean, that's just, I, that's what I think, I mean, that's the sort of throbbing heart of music. It's like seeing someone live. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, not everyone would agree. And I, I've been more comfortable making studio productions and I've been really loving that. Right. And like almost wanting another life where I'm not touring and all of that, but you just can't remove that. So I think got to just work out how to present that thing to people. In a, in a way that just just totally gets over what it is you're passionate about, you know. So just like condensing that musical vision and giving it out in a live style, just just doing it by just absolutely boot camp style. You got to get out there. You just got to play shows right. to the point where you're beaten down, so your ego is completely stripped. And you know that you're just one of a billion other people trying to really push it. I think you have to know how that feels. Mm -hmm. You can't just be like, enti any entitled thing is going to screw with you. Because even if you have a short-term success, it will screw with you. And I've been really grateful that I've been basically slowly but surely roasting this... Copy me. Roasting this bean. <laughs> yeah, this huge career bean <laughs> in the oven and it's like nicely baked. Right. And I didn't just throw in a microwave, you know what I mean? Yeah. I like this, it tastes a lot richer, it's, I understand how, what it's taken to, to get it this far. So um, that's the thing. I mean, everyone's career path is different. It's, it must be amazing to also have overnight like, success. I mean, it's part of you that everyone kind of wants a crazy taste of that. But I think also the music business is changing and the, the whole rock and roll, expectation you know some of that shit is just like gotta go anyway yeah well in my experience you know? is that even when people think something happened overnight it probably didn't right? definitely so, definitely um, so yeah. i mean that's it i like, i think that just get 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 out and get get playing live and get your ego cut down All like right. in a way that you can handle so that you're ready for the kind of for the ups and downs because you've got to be ready for the ups and downs to stay in it yeah. I mean, you can kind of come in and take a ride for a bit and then get off the surfboard, you know, and just like ditch it. Yeah. And, you know, it's not your, it's not your, not, no fun anymore. But that's the thing. If you're going to stick with it, you've got to be ready to really... Do it. Yeah, you've got to be ready to play shit gigs to no one. Right? Yeah, and like, be homeless. You basically, and just, and just because you really love it. And the yeah. passion of music is amazing. I mean, that's one of the mystical th parts of it. I cool. never want to lose. So let's talk about passion and music in, in final, final close. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, by the way, for yeah, having pleasure. us Thanks, in your home, me. in your studio, yeah. making me coffee. Yeah, right on, that's man. Good. By all means. <laughs> what we would call cookies. What we would call cookies. Yeah, exactly. um, not biscuits, biscuits but yeah. cookies. <laughs> and um, what, so what, obviously you're a huge music fan. Yeah. I have a couple questions for you. Mm -hmm. First record you ever, you ever played. What, what you were listening to, bought, listened to, what was it, all the way back? Um, well, it was probably, it, was, it probably was a charity record, actually. I mean, not that, not that I don't know why. It, it wasn't even really for charitable causes. But I think I just kind of, for some reason, just bought, like, you know, Save the World, Feed the World, when that came out on 7-inch. Gotcha. All right, on 7-inch, that was my next yeah. question, more format. First show you ever saw. Uh, oh God, uh, Christ, I don't actually know. I think it might really randomly be Curve. <laughs> Do you know that band? I've heard of it, I couldn't yeah. tell anything about them. Curve, it was Curve at um, K 
Cambridge, the junction in Cambridge. I lived in Cambridge. It's a really bad town to go and see music. But yeah, that, that was, that and was then, it. And then what about, um, God, what about now? Me. What about, give me, give us, if you had to make a recommendation of something that you're, that you love now, it doesn't have to be new, but something that some people should go out and purchase if they don't already own. What would you, Ooh. what would you, what would you say? Well, I've been listening to, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm always, the, the, the history thing is really confusing, you know, cause it's like modern stuff, like. And, and, and getting your attention versus the old stuff. It's always a hard thing, right? When it's all laid out on the table of pleasure. It's like, do you pick something new for the novelty sake, for like being current, or do you just look at the table and just think, well, this is just amazing. I mean, so that's the thing. If you're going back in time, we've been listening to this Donny Hathaway record. This has been, I've never listened to it before. Which one? Uh, I actually don't know the name of it. It's like he's standing on the street. It's got in the ghetto and like. Right. Yeah. And uh, I don't know the name of that one. Yeah, right. it's I'm been a result sure. of Spotify. I've got to say that I just end up going. Oh, I want to hear some Donny Hathaway right now. And just type it in and like just let it play. It's like, oh, beautiful, you know. Right. And it's like just the mood hits you, and it's like that cool possibility. It is bad though for checking out new music potentially because I don't necessarily have that spirit and I don't follow a lot of new stuff. But I do. do, do I do like Dane Funk a lot. I like that guy. I just like his thing. I just like his. It just seems like a fun guy. I just want to hang out with him. And uh, I just, I, I love the synths and all his, all his kind of ramblings. Yeah, he's just like he'll do like <laughs> ten minute tracks, just like yeah. Yeah. going on it to a drum machine. And I love that. You know, it's like that's the spirit of that P funk shit. It's just like man, just let it, let it go. So I've been. All right, really well, Donny Hathaway and Dan Funk then. Yeah, that's why true. not? All right, yeah, man. Thanks again. Really Pleasure, appreciate yeah. you Thanks taking for the time and inviting us in. It's yeah, been great. Time, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Pleasure. Jamie. Thanks, man. Mr. Jimmy. Pleasure to meet you. Thanks, everybody, for watching uh, This Week in Music. We'll see you next week. I feel good, uh, even though I shouldn't. I'm chilling so hard, couldn't tell you where the hood is. Uh, I'm looking like a million bucks, sucker. I'm